Hello and welcome to Spotlight with Sandhya. We are starting the third season of this talk show here in Mysore, where I am with my old friend Prasanna. Hello. I know Prasanna best as a theatre person and as an activist, but there's more to him as we will discover during our conversation today. So Prasanna, you know, you lead a life that many are surprised at. But I frankly am envious of the life that you've lived. Uh, you've been a rolling stone, but you've also been someone who's set the bar so high in the things that you achieve. So but let's roll back to the time that you dropped out of IIT Kanpur. Why did you do that? Well, I, I realized I was not going to become a good scientist. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm talking more about my temperament. You know, as a scientist, I then thought you needed a different temperament. You know, a, a long uh, periods of concentration. I have short periods of very intense concentration. So I decided to get back into the cultural world. And theater was my choice because I used to do theater before. So and then you managed to get into the National School of Drama. Very prestigious and very difficult to enter, I would think. But um, tell me a little bit more about your experiences there before we move on to why you dropped out of there. <coughs> National School was uh, uh, who, who was young at that time. And it had a very young uh, director who actually shaped it, the great uh, Mr. Alkazi. Um, it was in a small uh, piece of the Rabindra Bhavan, uh, you know, the, the building which houses uh, all the academies. Uh, it was an amazing place at that time. Um, there was very personal attention and National School was probably the first educational institute which was completely informal. Even uh, um, examinations mm -hmm. would be done uh, with everybody sitting, uh, examiners and the examined and all the students we would be discussing it, we could reject them, we could uh, dis, you know, disagree with them and all that. Uh, and also national school at that time was a very heterogeneous group. Mm -hmm. There would be a Ex air hostess coming as a student on one hand, and some uh, peasant from uh, or the son of a peasant uh, from Bihar coming there, and then somebody like me who was a uh, dropout from science and all that. So it was, in some ways, a very difficult place. But when you look back, you realize that you actually had imbibed the whole country there. Also, uh, in terms of a vision. The drama school was quite uh, amazing at that time. Uh, I remember when I took my interview, Mr. Alkazi very clearly asked me, are you going to go back to Karnataka? Mm -hmm. He said, look, if you go back to Karnataka, I will offer you a seat. Otherwise, no. And, and he said, look, uh, we want people to go back to their, uh, uh, you know, states and languages and cultures and work there, you know, spread theatre, build the modern Indian theatre. And you did do that, right? I did do that uh, and quite a few people uh, did that, you know, Mr. Uh, uh, M.K. Raina, Bansi Kaul. But uh, quickly it changed, the situation changed. Within a few years, the the road led to Bollywood, to Bombay. You mean at the NST? Yeah, the from, from, from the National School. People would have already gone uh, by the second year or so to Bombay to uh, book a room there uh, so that they could uh, settle down the moment uh, they finished the course. Of course, some of them uh, made uh, big careers. You know, Some of them became stars uh, and all that. But uh, I didn't do that partly because... Maybe I was feeling uh, a bit of an ego. I had already dropped out of science and gone into theater. So I said, no, I cannot go into technology all over again or into this thing. Let me better stick to theater. So at that time, I, if I'm right, your contemporaries were people who have become legends like Nazaruddin Shah. Amrish yes, Puri? Yes. Uh, Om Puri, Om Puri. Nasir. They were all a uh, little senior to me, but we were in the same uh, three-year uh, thing. All right. So you, 
if you had willed you could have also followed the same career trajectory yes i could have um, i told you i mean i didn't want to all right so let's move to what you did when you came back to karnataka you started samudaya you became a marxist tell us how that happened the, the times were like that uh, when was I this in the to, 70s yeah yeah when i went to the national school of drama it was the it was still the better days of congress but by the time i came back already emergency was on and there was a lot of uh, frustration especially amongst the uh, the thinking people mm -hmm. uh, there was student protest and all that uh, also the national school i think it opened up my mind um, and 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 i realized uh, i didn't realize i became a leftist it wasn't even a political decision it was more of a Uh, you know heartfelt decision to be on the left on the people side than on the other side i came back to karnataka uh, we immediately had to go almost underground okay. um, because the sort of activity we were trying to plan either in theater or in uh, other things uh, there were problems but it was great fun it was amazing experience because uh, within 2 years we had built 40 units of samudaya all over karnataka we had uh, gone into north karnataka hyderabad karnataka and uh, you know people who had never done uh, modern theater mm -hmm. dalits and uh, women and young girls came into theater some of them became very well known uh, theater personalities later so it was a So, but this was theater, which was activist in nature. It was not just theater for the sake of entertainment. You brought them in to awaken their conscience and to get them to be participative in the uh, body to politic. Yeah, but uh, I wouldn't say Samudaya was trying to do a deliberately political theater. Okay. You see, we were very committed to theater. We were mm -hmm. committed to good theater. Mm. uh we we were very clear that theater is both art and an instrument for what we then called radical mass education okay so we did very serious uh, theater you know we did proscenium theater we also did street theater we had some of the finest uh, people from all over the country coming and directing us badal sarkar for right. example the yeah. legendary right. uh, you know bengali director he came and conducted a lot of workshops for us satyu directed plays for us mm -hmm. i mean it was i told you it was the golden day of uh, theater in karnataka then that was the time when uh, you know um, the anant nag and shankar nag uh, started their group even while they were working in cinema right. so it was it was really uh, an expansion of uh, theater and the world of uh, expression right so but you moved on to do something else after that right you went off to hegodu and uh, you created a new movement over there can we talk about that well this samudaya as i told you was great and passionate work but it also tired me out after about 5 6 years i was really really tired you know and uh, so i told my friends in samudaya that look i am not quitting but i i just have to go because it's too much uh, you know mm. in terms of my private life and uh, that uh, also my marriage which which was also part of the the revolutionary thing okay was uh, not working out so i moved to hegodu the village that's the first time i moved from the big city to the village uh, i went to hegodu partly because uh, hegodu was a theater village right. you know mr subarna had built this great institution he was a friend uh, and uh, he, i used to go there and uh, write plays direct them and give it to him for publication so i went there and stayed there and uh, i remember at, in that period i had actually uh, started a carpentry workshop in uh, hegodu i mm -hmm. was designing furnitures there okay i mean i have done crazy things like that you know right 
So talking about crazy things, you also had a very brief but very successful stint in the corporate world where you were heading ITV, right? Yeah. So how was your experience in Delhi leading one of the, I think it was the only uh, television software producing company at that time? Yeah, yeah. See what happened after uh, a while in uh, Hegodu, uh, I had to go to Delhi to make some money and I had mm -hmm. to live. And also I was getting married the second time. Um, so I went to Delhi, I was living in Delhi and uh, living very frugally. In fact, I used to live on the Barsati of uh, Bhisham Sahani's uh, house. Oh. You know, the great Bhisham Sahani, the writer, Balraj Sahani's brother. They had uh, offered that Barsati free to me. Okay. And uh, it, it was again an amazingly creative period. I, I wrote my book there and didn't have much money but would uh, stay put and write. And in the evening, I would go to the press club and meet some of my friends there okay. and have a drink maybe and walk down. Um, and then one day, somebody came uh, and this somebody was uh, was wanting to find a chief executive for uh, the company. And some of the journalists told him, look, there is this fellow sitting there in the on the third floor in the Deccan Herald office. He's, uh, he won't agree to you, but don't let him go. <laughs> so, so that's how the fellow uh, was a great man. We know the not we know the I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. He would not let me go, and he made me take this job. I needed this job, of course. But I was getting married. I told you, and uh, so I was the chief executive for about a year and a half. Uh, it was a good job. I, I turned around the company, which was going through a difficult times. But then, uh, you know, I wasn't uh, the type traveling all over and uh, hopping from flight to flight and having these uh, intricate uh, corporate uh, meetings and all that. It wasn't my cup of tea. So that's when I decided I will quit the city. You know, and that's when I came back to Hegodu, but this time to live in Hegodu. I built a house, shifted my whole family. By then I had a small son. We shifted and uh, started living there. And slowly, after a while, after staying there for about a couple of months, I realized I can't just be staying there. Right. Uh, I had to do something with the village. I had to do something with the people of the village. Hmm. You know, I had to become part of that village. You can't just be doing theater there. I, I was doing my theater elsewhere, you know, in the big cities. So that's how the idea of uh, Charkha shaped. So tell us more about Charaka. It's based on this whole uh, cooperative and handmade, uh, you know, handmade products. And it's also empowering the local women. So there are three different strands coming together. How did you think of something like that? Well, I told you I wanted to do something which uh, made me relate to the village better. And uh, what I had found uh, after about six months of living in that village was this village is on the Western Ghats, a very lovely village, a lot of greenery. But then it is like any part of Western Ghats, very, very uh, threatened ecologically. Very fragile. Uh, very fragile. And the funny thing is, most people do not realize the one of the factors that was affecting the ecosystem mm -hmm. were the poor people. Oh. The poor people don't know anything except agriculture. Mm -hmm. So out of a desperation, they would just go into a slightly higher area, fence it off and try to do agriculture. Okay. Agriculture would fail. They would fail. And uh, the ecosystem meant, yeah, also failed. Destroyed. So I said, look, unless we give them an alternative uh, profession or a work which will not destroy the forest, you are not going to solve this problem. You are not going to send them out of this place because it belongs to them, not to me. They have been the inhabitants of that place. It's just that the uh, explosion of population had resulted. So that's when the idea of doing something else came and that's when I chose handlooms. Handloom is never there on the Western Ghats mm -hmm. because of the dampness in the 
right, you right, know, in, right, in about yeah. six months in a year. And also because cotton was not grown on the mm -hmm. Western Ghats. So traditionally, f cloth and uh, quilts and, you know, woolen mm -hmm. would come from the plains uh, into the villages. But then uh, by the time uh, I was there, uh, hardly 70 kilometers away were uh, these uh, mills which produced the yarn. Okay. So you could get the yarn close by and I decided I'll try uh, handlooms. It was tried really as a very small experiment. In fact, we did not go into weaving to begin with. Oh. We just went into tailoring uh, handloom kurtas. Okay. I said, I need a kurta. Mm -hmm. I am the first customer. And then there may be a hundred other friends of mine who would need the kurta. So that is how the journey started. I would bring uh, handloom fabric from elsewhere, from Tamil Nadu or from Karnataka, wherever. Get it stitched. And then slowly we set up one loom and then a weaver was brought in as a master weaver. And then we did dyeing, then we did printing, we did... And then we decided uh, that uh, dying is, you know, dying is actually a terrible thing. Right, it's the, of all the second most uh, polluting uh, thing mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. next only to nuclear fuels. Okay. It's because of the, um, you know, volumes. Right. You know, dying is a huge industry. It's polluting. Entire China was polluted by that. Entire Tamil Nadu was polluted by dying. What about the so-called natural dyes? which we exactly. used to use. Yeah, that's what we decided. We said, we will, uh, you know, get into natural dyeing. And then the search began. I had to go and bring people, commit mistakes. But eventually, we shifted to natural dyeing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we also did uh, uh, gray, uh, gray water treatment. Okay. So actually, Charka now has become a beautiful place, mm -hmm. multi-process uh, cooperative. It has its own uh, shops run by another trust which I started called Desi. Right. And uh, also, uh, it has become a, you know, a production system which can become something like Amul for the sector. Fantastic. In fact, that's the dream. You know, what Amul did to uh, Indian women, mm -hmm. rural uh, impoverished women, by providing milk as a product that they can sell right. uh, by an organization which they own. Right. This is very important. You know, actually Amul is owned by village women. Right. You know, indirectly, of course, but, but they have a controlling uh, stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, that is what we want Charkha to become. Wonderful, wonderful. And I know that it's making waves because I see it in, you know, the fabrics and the material and the clothes designed by Charaka and marketed through Desi. I see it increasingly visible in urban areas. So I think the popularity proves that it, this model is working. Yeah. In fact, um, there was no problem in growth for Charaka. I would say I actually prevented uh, the growth or, or a speedy growth, let me put it that way. Right. Because, Why is that? Because, you see, the, the, the whole problem is you have to first set up a system mm -hmm. of production. And that system of production should be perfect. And then you can spread it and expand it or something. So, do you so think we took 30 years to 30 set up. 30 years? Yeah. Okay. Because all, this, all the processes had to be set up. All the back end of those processes, the fore end of the processes, the lab and the testing lab and the design uh, lab, all that had to be set up. It took us a lot of time. We did not take much money from anybody to do that. Uh, in fact, the first 20 years, it was just our own money, you know. We actually made profits. Wonderful. And the profit that was made by Desi, the other trust, would be pulled back to Charka. Uh, so... I'm very proud of uh, whatever I've done in uh, Charka, so, more than anything else. There is a, uh, you know, very, very obvious parallel that strikes me here. 
especially because I come from Bangalore and then you see all this huge impetus for the startups to scale up, get funding, grow fast and reward their investors. And here you have something that you have put in so much of time and you feel the reward is in the success that it has created as a model and not in just the money part of it, which of course it has sustained. So I see this very, very obvious uh, parallel and I think this is so much more satisfying because it has really impacted the lives of the people who are involved in it and there's so much more satisfaction in seeing the transformation and in viewing this thing as a, you know, what do you call like the whole emphasis would be on not hurrying to make money and hurrying for success. You, you cannot hurry. Marketing can hurry but production cannot hurry. If you, if you, if you really... For example, there is this uh, uh, biography of a uh, Korean, mm -hmm. Korean who set up right, uh, Amul. Amul. You know, it's a fascinating tale. The man fights every inch with uh, ministers, with bureaucrats, with uh, competitors, and with the lethargy of the village people. Right. And gradually he sets up. He doesn't uh, rush. He takes a lot of time, you know. Amul became Amul about 30 years later. Hmm. Meanwhile, he had set up uh, the factory, he had set up the marketing system, he had set up Irma, you know, Rural Marketing right. uh, Institute. You see, it is that which matters. In production, you have to set up the whole system. It's a slow process. Once that is there, then you do your marketing, then you go all over the world if you want to, you know. So, so Charaka is trying to do that, you know, go the slow way, you know, hold the growth uh, little. Don't, don't just rush simply because somebody is willing to fund you or some startup fellow is going, giving you money. No, that will not help, you know. The basics have to be very sound yes, and sustainable. Yes, yes, so yes. this is something that I see in all the organizations that you have built. And I think that's a huge uh, management lesson to be learned in that because... Though you, as a creative person, you have felt that you need to move on to something else. You left the framework so good that maybe the third or the fourth generation of people are still continuing with it. I still see plays by Samudha being, Samudaya being staged. You still see you know, whatever you did in the early stages with uh, Charaka, seeing, you know, uh, we see the results. And now you have come here to Mysore and you have set up something new. So, can we talk about what you're doing in Mysore now? Yeah, but before that, uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what you said just now. Uh, I mean, what uh, I've, I've dabbled into three or four uh, organizations. But uh, look at our, uh, you know, leaders of our national movement. Mm -hmm. Gandhiji... Uh, influenced thousands of young people to set up charkhas and the, the you know amuls of the world. Hmm. And what did he do? He, whenever a young person came with an idea, he would talk to that young person, be very frank, very natural, very honest, mm -hmm. and discuss the whole thing. Send the young person back, and eventually, when he is convinced, he would just say, "Okay, go and set it up." All right. You see, I would say that is the real decentralization. That is true leadership. You have to, you know, uh, make people inspired. Ignite that spark. Ignite that spark. Problem is, you know, we what we do is we go and think that we are the thing. We are inevitable. We can't. I mean, the organization will not run beyond me. Mm -hmm. What nonsense. If the organization cannot run beyond you, it will have to die because you are going to die. So, so, so I don't think I'm very successful, but I'm, I'm, I'm serious about decentralization. I'm serious about others taking up and I'm serious about inspiring some people, hopefully, uh, you know, to do things. All right. So talking about inspiring... Let me touch upon this one point because you created this huge uh, movement against uh, the GST that was being imposed on the handmade. And you created this whole word, 
you know handmade instead of hand loom and hand this so we saw the arts being referred to as handmade i remember you know the, we used to have performances and they, instead of just having a speech against this 18 person gst we would have a music performance we would have a dance performance and it was you know, music as handmade dance as handmade literature as handmade so how effective was that you know in any movement uh, there is a major component of it uh, that is advocacy right especially when you are setting up a, a production system and especially uh, that production system when it is not in work today but you know that it has to be in work tomorrow if humanity mm -hmm. has to survive at all hmm. i mean let's let's have no confusion about it if you don't set up uh, the hand making uh, sector as production sector in a big way and start shifting slowly from this highly automated situation we are going to perish there's no way you're going to sustain this sort of horrible uh, burning economy it's an economy of fire everything needs to be burnt in order to produce some silly pen or some silly nib or some silly thing you can't you, this is no way you are going to have this this year in the north the temperature now in april may it has gone to 53 degrees can you imagine it's almost 10 degrees more than normal uh, why is it happening so when when you know that this has to happen you have to first believe it i believed 30 years back mm -hmm. that hand looms is the fabric of the future hmm periods hand loom is the fabric of the future future it is not selling today people are not uh, interested in it today bureaucrats are only weeping and giving you know shedding uh, silly crocodile tears, tears crocodile tears yeah. uh, about it ministers don't care for it just last week the central government can you believe it has passed an order that the indian flag can be made in synthetic fabric can you imagine and not only that rubbing salt on the uh, this thing they have said it can be imported indian flag you can import it come on you already you know you are uh, exporting the whole bloody country and now you want to do this the problem is they are ignorant they are not bad people they just are ignorant they just don't know what why is the greatest symbol of indian nation the sacred symbol it's a very sacred symbol you know why it is sacred because in india are all over the world all sacred things all sacred fabrics or sacred tool or sacred this thing has to be handmade in buddhism the the you know the robe of the priest is done by hand by the women and presented to the thing you are janevu for example all the brahmins the i don't know what has happened to brahmins you know janevu your uh, right, sacred and, thread yeah. it has to be made by hand and today we are making everything in synthetic and nobody cares so anyway coming back to the point i know this is the fabric of the future if there is going to be a future at all so i am not going to compromise in setting up that system if it takes 30 years well we have taken 300 years to destroy it let it take 30 years you know but let 300 million people realize that this has to be done then it will happen so that's what led to charka i really like yes please so i really admire your uh, enthusiasm prasanna i know you just celebrated your 72nd birthday last month and uh, you know you're really um i wouldn't want to call you an an icon and put you on a pedestal but you're certainly a role model for all of us to be focused on what we think is the right thing and go for it which also brings me to the point of what you're doing in terms of your own uh, stage craft the training that you're giving people and uh, can we talk about that you started a new school here now in mysore 
people have uh, asked me and they have thought that I have become uh, fascinated with hand making because of my um, adulation for Gandhi ji, mm -hmm. uh, which is true, but it's not really true. Okay. You know, the handmaking idea, the passion for the handmade, the passion for the recycle, the passion for Kabadi Bazaar, it started with my theater. Uh -huh. You know, it was Mr. Alkazi, the director of the National School of Drama, used to actually take us direction students. He himself would come on a Sunday in his standard car, take a couple of us to Jama Masjid, Mm -hmm. and show us around and say, come on, now pick up these things. Select what is good for your uh, next production. Okay. You know, these are old uh, vessels, old uh, whatever. All the props so, that you need for your... Yeah, it not place. just as a prop, but he would say, please understand the value of these amazing things. Okay. It's been thrown here like dust. But this has value. And the value is that it has been used by a hand. Mm -hmm. It's been used by a woman to cook. It's been used by somebody to make a tool. So he said, a thing, either a thing or a human being becomes beautiful through use. This thing of a beauty context where you are talking of a sublime, pure beauty is, I think, bullshit. <laughs> People become beautiful. A old woman is beautiful because of her experience, her right. age, her dignity. And the life that she has lived. Yes. Yeah. Same with the materials. Mm -hmm. So, it is theatre which taught me this. It is theatre which brought me into one sector and then took taken me into the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth sector. But there is consistency. The consistency is that you have to lead a simple life but a full life. If you can enjoy Ramayana or if you can enjoy uh, Homer... Uh, after having a nice uh, this thing. You know, you talk of leisure. The whole bourgeois system talks of leisure. Where is leisure in this world? Mm -hmm. What leisure are we talking about? I'm eating and negotiating some deal with some American uh, idiot. Is that leisure? So, you see, this is, for me, this is aristocracy. To live simply, but... Do what you want to do. If I want to go and see a village, I will go and see a village. I'll spend 15 days in that village. If I have to furnish my house, I'll go into a Kabadi Bazaar and I'll get those fabulous rosewood uh, furnitures. Maybe it's a little broken. You you repair it. What right. is the big deal? Mm -hmm. See, see, that's what needs to be done. We have to understand, become aware of materials. We have to become aware of human beings. Today, the governments are not even aware of human beings. They are passing orders as if uh, they have 20 million something, 20 million people. What does 20 million people mean? Are there 20 million uh, stones? Mm -hmm. The human beings, they have human and they're, they're creative. You could make them creative people. Can you imagine what India would be if 20 million people became creative people? Have we tried that? You have to, if you are the prime minister, if you are the chief minister, or even if you are just a small uh, head of an institution, you should try and make your people creative. Inspire them. Make them participate. You know? That's what, for example, you know, I'm, I'm now trying to do Ramayana. I'm doing this because here is a man even when he was just not even 18 year old, when his father uh, or, or his uh, stepmother tells him to get out and go into the forest because she wants her son to be the king, he goes without uh, batting an eyelid. Mm -hmm. And actually, he goes happily because he is in love with Sita, who is nature. Okay. This 18-year boy behaves like a civilized man. He says, of course, I'll go into the forest because a forest is not a forest. A forest is where all these monasteries are there. All these great uh, people are there. They have set up their uh, systems. They live there, do the hard work and also do, also write their great epics or uh, the great. So he goes there, lives with them, learns from them and he becomes what he is today. 
Unfortunately, we think of Rama as somebody with a huge golden throne. Sorry, he never wore a golden throne. There's never been a temple of uh, Rama. We've always worshipped Rama as Ramayana, as the text. He's a human being. Valmiki goes into great lengths to prove that Rama is a human being, but as good a human being as God. Maryada mm Purushottama. -hmm. Correct. And I think if you want to really be serious about Rama, let us try and make every Indian a Maryada Purushottama. Right. We will never become a Maryada Purushottama, but we should try to become a Maryada Purushottama. At least aim not, to be. Not the, 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 the Jagadalu Purushottama. Mm -hmm. We have all become the fighting cocks of India. I fight the Muslims and the Muslim fights the Christian, the Christian fights somebody else. How can you build a nation like this? How can you build the creativity? This nation cannot become great only because of Reliance and Ambani's and Adani's. This nation is going to become great if we inspire the young people to work together. It's very important. A factory needs people to be together. A school needs people to be together. A, 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 a convent or a nursery or, or a sante, uh, you know, has to have people coming together, working with each other. There will always be fights. But you can't push the fight up. You have to push the fight down mm -hmm. and make people come together. I'm a theater person. I can't do theater if I can't work with other people. Right. There's no way individually I can do theater. Right. In, in drama, we call it a dialogue. Mm -hmm. A dialogue needs at least two persons. Mm -hmm. I have to be sitting with you to be talking to you. Mm -hmm. If you're not there, how can I dialogue? Can I dialogue with a wall? I'll be a monologue. Exactly. And India is becoming millions and millions of cacophony of monologues. Nobody is listening. Everybody is shouting and everybody is angry about everybody else. For heaven's sake. You can be angry with everybody, the thing, but what will this country do? So, let me take this in another direction now. So, just before we came here, while we were discussing on the way to the studio, we were also talking about, you know, how a modern technology, while it is empowering in many ways and it intended to do good, it also amplifies all the negative voices and It thoughts. isolates. It, you know, isolates the biggest the problem with technology is that it isolates you because it needs to provide you the substance, the product, or whatever you call it, separately. Cinema was, was at least jointly seen. Today, television isolates you and straight away brings you, what do you want? You want Hollywood, I'll give you. You want uh, Hindi cinema, I'll give you. You want something else, I'll give you. You, you want Ram, I'll give you. You want Paigambar, I'll give you. But don't join hands. So I hate technology. I, I'm a technology man. I, I studied in Kanpur IIT. But I hate technology because it is isolating the human being. And an isolated human being is always suspicious. He's always doubtful. He's always scared because he doesn't know who is going to, uh, you know, backstab uh, him. Everybody is scared of being backstabbed. Every political party is scared of being backstaged, backstabbed by their own second in command or the third in command. This is bad. You can't build a country like this. You can't build theater like this. You know, in, in, in rehearsals, if I have a 10 member cast, if nine people come and one person is absent, the people who suffer are those nine who have actually come. Not the one they person who stayed away. Yes. They can't uh, rehearse unless this 10th uh, fellow comes. Mm -hmm. So for a theatre person, discipline is important. Working together is important. Frugality is important because we don't have tons and tons of money like cinema people. Mm -hmm. uh, recycling is important. It is not just recycling of uh, props. I recycle words. I recycle situations. I recycle human experience, which is what theatre does. 
So for me, all this, you know, people may say I have become like this because of Gandhi. Yes and no. I have also become like this because of Bertolt Brecht. Bertolt Brecht, in the play Mother, at the beginning of the play, he makes this old woman to thrust this vessel, this old battered vessel, to the audience and you know what she says? She says, see, look, how can I cook without meat, without uh, whatever, without uh, vegetables? My son has to go for work. He's young. What do I do? So people are first made to look at that. That is socialism for me. Mm -hmm. To make people aware Make people aware of what is the value of each person. A beggar, if he is begging, that is not his flaw. Go and make him creative. I'm sorry. I. Yo, that's fine. So I really would like you to tell us a little bit more about this um, acting school that you are doing. And you started it during the pandemic. You, you were one of the, though you hate technology, you harnessed it to do something good. You've been training people. And I do remember one of your star pupils much before all this was the great Irfan. Well, you see, with, with most artists, um, there are good times, there are bad times. In fact, there will be more uh, lean periods than the peaks. Um, and uh, when the lean period comes, an artist, a sensible artist, what they do is they will not keep uh, blaming somebody else, but mm -hmm. they will just keep training the younger people. Because you don't have work, you can't do a production and mm -hmm. get uh, enough money to be paid and so that you can survive. You train people. K.G. Subramaniam, the great painter, did that. All the great masters of European art did that. Most writers do it, sensible writers. You know, Tagore did that, uh, Arbindo did that. They all do that because that's the best thing to do. So I have been training and teaching uh, actors for the last 40 years, maybe 45 years. In fact, that has given me more dividends than all my productions. Mm -hmm. Because all my productions put together will not bring as much audience as one day's audience of Amitabh Bachchan. <laughs> <laughs> See, how many people can I get? So, for me, training actors is a very, very important thing. And today, these actors have become superstars, they have become television actors, they have become theater actors. So, I say, Times are like this. If you have to act in cinema, you go and act in cinema. But if you come to me, I am going to teach you the real thing. The real thing that kicks you hard in your belly. Mm -hmm. And they like it. Because they also realize mm -hmm. that they may be talking bullshit in front of a camera, mm -hmm. but they can't be bullshitting for long. Right. They have to actually understand the mechanics of acting, the skill of acting. So they're coming back. They're desperate. I know, for example, somebody who has done a serial or cinema for four years or five years knows that the dynamism is lost. He will have to, he or she will have to quickly go and recharge themselves. Yeah, they become jaded by the whole they process. They become jaded. It's natural. Right. So this institute idea is to train them, get a little money out of it, and then put it into production. So what is the name of this institute? Well, the institute's name is going to be Mysore Theatre Institute or something. Okay. But the brand name of that uh, training program is going to be Acting Shastra. Very nice. And it, it's already started, right? It has started. It has okay. started. Um, it's going to be uh, done all over. Uh, some of it will be done in Mysore, but it can also be done in Bombay or in... So, apart from being, you know, physical workshops, face-to-face, -face, would you also be doing things online? Yes. A lot of uh, uh, the free thing will be let out on online. I don't want to be charging. We charge because uh, I need to fund the repertory. You know, we, we need to pay the actors to be performing for theatre and not for cinema. Right. Know? Do you know, even if I pay 5,000 rupees per performance to an actor, the actor will be still getting less than a chaprasi's monthly salary. 
that's true what is 5000 rupees so, for an so, entire and if i have to pay 5000 rupees per actor in a performance i have to subsidize it so what's the timeline for you to start this acting shastra classes have they already begun are you going to start them the first uh, workshop is going to happen in may already people are uh, uh, applying and there's a huge how do they rush. apply for it online online okay. uh, what is the website where they can uh, reach i you? can't remember but uh, okay they will know and uh, what when is this production of ramayana going on stage the Ramayana production will happen in the first week of uh, May. All right. And uh, it will keep happening, hopefully. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of music in it. There's a lot of theatricality in it. Right. And there's a lot of Ramayana in it. Right. We have chosen this particular episode or the particular chapter in Ramayana uh, because it is, in a sense, the negative aspect of the positive side of Rama. Oh, interesting. In the sense... Uh, you see, Rama represents somebody who, who is beyond money, beyond uh, power, beyond this thing. He's in love with nature and he wants to be a simple person even when he's a leader. But then his father is a rich man. He's the king, uh, the king of the whole uh, country and all that. And he has many wives. He has three special queens and then 355 ordinary queens. So there's wow. a there's um, a there's a fight and a bitter fight, you know, kai right, kai. Yeah. So actually, the fight is foregrounded and Rama is backgrounded. Okay. Rama is like the foundation, but uh, or uh, rather uh, the background. Background mm -hmm. and uh, this terrible, terrible fight, which is, I mean, sometimes I tell people that. Valmiki is better than Dostoevsky or, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or any of these modern uh, greats. And creating the situation of strife. My God, the accuracy and the detail of working that he does is amazing. You know, it's truly amazing. And we are trying to bring that out. Rama doesn't even appear in the play. Uh, Ramayana without Rama in it. Rama and Sita have gone to the forest. We have sent them to the forest. Okay, they're in but one they're of us. there. Okay. I know their uh, their influence is coming. Right. It, it's it fills up the whole thing, but the actual thing that happens, the dramatic thing that happens, is a fight. Incidentally, in any drama, if bad people are not there, drama cannot happen. <laughs> you know, if villains are not there. What do the hero do? How long can a hero dance with a heroine uh, in uh, parks? People get bored, you know. Where is it going? When is it going to premiere and where is it going to premiere? F oh, fifth at uh, Kala Mandira, the small uh, theatre uh, next Mysore? Yeah. Good. So, I look forward to coming back to this beautiful city and watching the premiere of my friend Prasanna's latest play, which is about the epic Ramayana, but... I'm not giving away anything here. There's no Rama in it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Spotlight with Sandhya. Until I'm back again with another episode, take care and bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Do subscribe to the Raintree Media channel on YouTube. Like, comment and share the videos.